This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze. And you know, we're all in a maze every single day of our life. We can plan ahead exactly the path we want to take, but I guarantee you almost every day we take some sort of a detour. I know I already have, and it's only about 1230, actually one o'clock on a Monday afternoon. Um, so I welcome you all to follow the maze and welcome our guest, Maxwell Ivy. And Maxwell, you have um, a nickname and the nickname is the blind blogger. How do you blog yeah. if you're blind? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's interesting that I'm still getting this question. What is it? Um, probably six years later, but yeah, um, no, but it's it's just really it just really reminds me that I have to continue sharing sharing how I do things because uh, a lot of people still haven't heard the stories yet. So, um, for somebody who is visually impaired, like I am, starting a blog, uh, it really. Uh, is a lot simpler now than it would have been a long time ago. But basically, there are, are several screen reader options that, you know, convert text to speech on the screen of your computer or your tablet or your phone. There's also lots of screen magnification systems for people who still have some vision left. But I would say the, the more important thing is, is whether you are blind or sighted, uh, whether you are disabled or able bodied, the harder part about starting a blog really just comes down to getting past all those uh, distractions like, you know, is my website good enough? Does my blog look good enough? Are people going to want to hear what I have to say? Um, am I going to be able to manage the technology that I have to? And, you know, so many people are really afraid of the, the technology, even when the platforms like WordPress and Blogger and others are very are fairly straightforward. Um, so. I would say it's it's a matter of, for me of using the technology that's there and then, you know, doing the work, you know, showing up and thinking, OK, what story did I hear this week or what experience did I have this week that I can share on my blog or my podcast? And, you know, it's one of those things I really didn't think about what I was doing at the time I was doing. It was just I had started my first website in 2007. The Midway Marketplace, where I help, still help people sell used carnival equipment, and people said, "Okay, you finally succeeded. You have a website. Now you need a blog." Uh, <laughs> so, so I was like, "Okay, if I have to have one, there has to be some way I can have one." So, um, thankfully, I've been a Mac user for years, and there's this wonderful application called Mars Edit, which was originally designed to allow people to create their blog posts offline when they're away from the internet. But it was designed really well for uh, people who are visually impaired. And it basically works like a text editor. So if you're familiar with WordPerfect or right. yep. text editor, you know, it works Word, it works. It's it's very simply laid out and it allows a blind person to, you know, to write the file, uh, to tell the thing where it wants, where you want it to put your photos and your links at, and then press send. And then it deals with all the back end stuff that at wherever your blog is hosted. So it really makes things so much simpler. And you know, I've I've been using a typewriter long before a keyboard and a keyboard for a long time now too. So I'm I'm very comfortable with a keyboard. I'm not so comfortable with dictation or uh or recording myself and then having somebody transcribe it. But I know there are lots of people that, that works really well for you. Sure. So um so you know Mars edit helped me and then you know, really, you just have to continue to do the work. And as I'm sure you know, with your with your podcast, um, they aren't going to be there aren't going to be huge crowds the first post you write. You know, <laughs> and takes there a long time. Be, yep. it takes a while to build up uh, traffic, much less to build up comments and to have people that are sharing your content. So, a lot of this really just it has you know just have to understand. That it's going to take a while. Unfortunately, there are still people from, you know, like 15 years ago who are like, you know, if you pick the right niche and you write the right kind of content, you can be, you get content, you can be rich and famous in 90 days. You know, there's still a few of those crazy folks out there. Um, thankfully, most of them are now telling people how to podcast instead of blog, but <laughs> it just, it just seems like we all, it seems like always the experts, the ones getting paid crazy money to be the authorities 
are advising people to do things that don't make sense for them. So yes, it takes a while to create an audience for a blog or a podcast or a YouTube channel. And, you know, for me, I have, I've, I'm one of these people, I have a lot of experience finding unusual creative solutions. Part of that is because of my background in the traveling carnival. Part of that is uh, growing up, gradually losing my vision and having to constantly adapt for, for the different levels of vision I had at any one time. And so that's been a wonderful thing to apply to being a blogger or a podcaster, because as you know, the, the stuff on the internet is always changing. Right. And when you have a lot of experience being flexible and adaptable, it really does help as the landscape changes. And it's, uh, it's allowed me to basically go, okay, this is the way everybody else is doing it. Can Max do it that way? Yes. Then if I can go ahead and start doing it. But if Max can't do it that way, is there some way Max can do it? And, you know, before I started blogging, I mentioned I had a, I had a website before my first blog. Um, I had to teach myself how to code HTML to get my first website online. Right. Yep. So, so, you know, I decided that that was my only available solution. I embraced it. I went through the online tutorials and was eventually able to create my own website. So that's, that's what you have to do. And it, it, it applies to, you know, creating content. I, I, uh, I love it when people post about there not being anything for them to write about. And I'm like, I'm like, come on, open your eyes, you know, open your ears. There's stuff around you. There's probably stuff in your own life that you could apply to your blog that would apply to your business that you could use as teaching moments or as entertainment moments to build that relationship with your, with your audience through your blog or your podcast. But, you know, a lot of people, they just don't want to use those because they think it'll make them look bad or something. But me, well, you know, I think a lot of people, and you mentioned in the beginning, a lot of people say, well, who's going to want to hear my story? Who's going to want to listen to me podcast? Um, and, you know, I remember when I started blogging back in, wow, close to beginning of year 2000. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing it because um, I was very active in Autism Speaks and I wanted to share, you know, what autism is, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, that definition that you find on uh, in Google, there's so much more to it. And in the beginning, I couldn't tell how many people were reading my blog and I really didn't care because I was expressing myself. And now I'm finding out that I've had followers for over 20 years mm -hmm. and they, and they still reach out to me. Um, and so I think you're right. If it's something you want to do, there's a way you can adapt to it. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think what you said is a perfect example. People are afraid who's going to want to hear what I have to say. And it applies to bloggers, to podcasters, to authors, to musicians. I, uh, last year, there was an episode of 60 Minutes where they interviewed Sir Paul McCartney, and he talked about how one night, one morning, he called up the rest of the band and said, you know that album we just recorded yesterday? We recorded the whole album in the wrong key. We've got to do it all over again. It sounds horrible. The other three guys in the band said, uh, take something, go back to bed because you're wrong. <laughs> and it turned out they had another hit album. But, you know, there's a guy, Paul McCartney, even he's like, yeah, it ain't good enough. And even later in life, he will still people tell people that he thinks he can be a whole lot better than he is. And that's one of the immortals of the rock and roll world. So uh, most of us under, it, it seems like we do fall into two groups. So there are those of us like me and you who we probably had to be talked into starting our blog or our podcast the first, the first time, or we, we kind of backed into it, not realizing what we were doing, but then, and, and we have to be, we have to be reminded that we're, that what we're sharing is important and valuable. But then there's that other side of the coin where there are people who they've been, they've been reading their own headlines. They've been digesting their own website traffic numbers, and they are sure that the world loves their content and everything they post is gold. There aren't a lot of those people, but there are a few of them. Yep, you are. You know, when I first started podcasting, um, I was doing it for a local group here in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And they used to tell everybody all the time they were the number one internet radio station in the world. <laughs> and I was, I would sit there and laugh. It's like, I know you're not. Okay. 
but that's okay if that's what you want to say if that's what you believe um and recently one of them had contacted me and said you know you're never going to match us and i thought uh, you know i'm not trying to match anybody you know i'm delivering the content that i feel comfortable with inviting guests like you who have a story to tell and where we land we land and that's all that matters right and there's there's a couple of other other side points to what you're talking about the people that are doing this long term are doing this hoping to create a connection either with an audience or with one-on-one -on -one connections with people that uh they will then have actual personal relationships with you know there are people who are doing this for like you say we're doing this because we love doing it because we feel that it's important to share the information we're putting out into the world and we could care less about the stats and but then there are those people who they're going to be heartbroken if their downloads aren't a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand next week uh so it it really there's a there's a great baseball analogy somebody once asked uh i don't know if it, i think it was hank aaron about hitting home runs and he said i've never tried to hit a home run i've just tried to hit the ball hard makes sense yeah you know and that's that's really the way you have to approach your podcasting yeah some people they can decide this is going to be their profession. They can take the ten thousand dollar course and they can launch their podcast and you know and everything could be cool for them. But how long is it going to last? How satisfied are they going to be? Uh, how happy are they going to be with themselves personally, as opposed to somebody like me and you who we feel like we're going to get out of bed and share our personal stories or share information from the communities that we are we consider important with the rest of the world. And as you say, where it lands is where it lands. And I got to kick out of you when you were saying they, they say they're the number one online radio broadcast or whatever. Um, I have a, a good friend named Frederick by who actually helped me start my my podcast. And from the beginning, even though I knew it was, there was no way it could be true, but but he said it and I've continued saying it because it's just fun to say it from my point of view. He started introducing my podcast. He would say, with my friend, the, my host, uh, known around the world as the blind blogger, Max Ivy. And it's just, I heard it every week for six or seven months. And it kind of like, well, I know it ain't true, but it sounds really good. So let's just keep saying it. You know? <laughs> well, you know what? When I, you know, I don't, I look at my stats, but I don't, I don't live by my stats, you know? And, um, I have one show that we put on, on every Tuesday afternoon and he has, you know, gets really good listeners, but you know where most of his listeners are from? They're from India and they're <laughs> from South America. And somebody said to me, well, you know, is that good? I said, Hey, if people are listening, they're listening, you know, and it depends on, it depends on your purpose. That's not a good audience. If your goal was to monetize. Well, yeah, it's, yeah you're it's right. It's kind of hard to sell those countries, American products, which is where the monetization money is. But if you're, if your goal was to share your message and get in front of as many people as possible, then yes, I, I, when people ask me, Max, why do you go on so many podcasts? Why do you work so hard to promote your podcast? Is it because you want to get rich? I'm like, no, it's because every time I bring a guest on my show, they have a story. And it's my obligation to get them in front of as many people as I possibly can, right. because because if it doesn't matter how inspiring their story is, if nobody hears it, nobody's lives can be changed by it. And so that's that's what I go for. You know, I love it. So I'm going to go back a little bit because you had mentioned that, um, you know, you progressively lost your sight. So about what age were you when you started realizing that? Um, you know, I'm not seeing as well, and it's not just a pair of glasses I need. Right. Well, um, uh, it started gradually when I was, uh, four or five or six years old and the, the family noticed because I was falling down and running into more stuff than the rest of the kids. So they had my vision checked and, or they, they had me checked in general. And that doctor sent me to an eye doctor. I'm not sure, but we actually went to one of the few doctors in the entire southeast texas area that even knew what the heck retinitis pigmentosa was much less knew how to test for it so that helped a lot um i started with you know wearing the big eye patch on one eye to try to keep the same strength in both eyes um and i was 
uh, pretty good until I entered until just before I entered junior high school. And it's pretty common for men with RP to have a, a, a steep drop off in vision when they go through puberty. So uh, in like uh, fourth or fifth grade, I was still depending strictly on glasses. But by sixth and seventh grade, I was using a white cane and was staying after school to learn Braille and was transitioning to doing uh, all my schoolwork, you know, with uh, books on tape or books on record. At that time, there were still quite a few of the books that were on record, actually. Uh, um, you know, not that you can carry those around with you, but right. uh, so, so it's, it got to, you know, where the glasses were no longer any good and the white cane and that, uh, it kind of stayed there until I went off to college. And by the time, by the time I graduated from college, it was down to light perception, which is what it is now. And I have almost no peripheral vision and I can only see light when I look directly at the light. And most of the time, I cannot tell you what color it is. Uh, for, for example, I have, a, I have an LED lamp in front of me that I use for recording. And it, it has three different colors, but I cannot tell you which color is on, even though it's shining right at me. You okay. Know? So, and it's white, white, yellow, and blue are the three options. So you would think I would at least be able to tell the yellow from the white, but it's just not enough just not enough uh, light there for me to tell. So, and, and, you know, now, and the, and the thing is, is because I lost it gradually, you know, I went from being able to read a regular print book in a dark room to having to have a lot of light to magnify glasses and large and very thick glasses. Uh, and then eventually the closed circuit TV screen where you put this book up on the, up on the, up underneath it and it projects it for you in okay. very large print. And so I, I've, the other thing is, you know, I've gone from, I, in my life, I've used a manual typewriter to electric typewriters back when they were, you know, not all that great to, <laughs> to computer keyboards and now the smartphone. And I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert with my iPhone or my iPad, uh, but at least I understand all the concepts. And, you know, I think I'm probably about as good as most sighted people. Most, most people with their phones, we all seem to know what to do to make them do, but actually performing those actions when, when we absolutely need them to is always a challenge, I think. You, you know, I totally agree with you. I just got the new iPhone 13 and um, it has totally different features than my last one. And I'm constantly messing up. Um, and I teach IT on the weekend. So, oh. you know, it, that's, you know, I have to like, admit to people, you know what, I'm not a perfect person, I can do it. But you know, I can make a few mistakes along the way. But what I appreciate, and especially on this show, avoid the maze, is for people to understand that um, we all have abilities, we all have some disabilities, okay, even though we may not be labeled disabled, there, we, as humans, we can't do everything perfectly. But if we want to do something, we can find the way. And that's what I found remarkable about your bio on Podmatch, because as I've read it, it was like, you know, this is exactly what I believe in, that there is no reason that we should say we can't do things, because all we have to do is try or ask for help. Yeah, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you finished by saying ask for help, because that's one thing I feel is probably the most important thing I can share with anybody when I go on a podcast, which is one of the main ways I'm able to do all the things I do is because I allow, if somebody wants to help Max, they are going to get the opportunity to help Max and people are going to know that they, they helped Max, assuming that they performed what they said they were going to do and it helped and it actually improved my life or solved a problem. So growing up, knowing that you're going to lose your vision, uh, the two things that I was was taught the most in my young life was always look in the direction of the person you're speaking to and never be afraid to ask for help. So I've got, you know, I had over 20 years of, of it being drummed into me that asking for help was not a problem. In fact, that if I didn't do it, I was just going to make things harder for myself and things would take longer than they were going to take already if I tried to be, you know, the ultimate independent person and do everything by myself or find a way to do everything by myself. Because as you know, if you want to be stubborn enough about it, you can find ways to do everything in life yourself. 
trust me, it won't be fun. No. And it will take a whole bunch more time, energy, aggravation, and you'll accumulate a lot more gray hairs and wrinkled skin, trust me. <laughs> so, so, so I have an advantage here. I call it my superpower because I'm not afraid to ask. I am totally comfortable with the word no. I have no thoughts of being embarrassed, ashamed, or coming off as, as not being as good as people think I am because I asked for it because I because I got practice and I and I have the the okay for you know lots of people have said it's cool Max so the problem is is so many people in the world especially in the U S Canada and the Western world we are taught from a very early age either directly or by implication that it's a sign of weakness to ask for help that you know that if you have to ask somebody for help it means you're not capable and people won't want to do business with or be in a relationship with somebody who has to constantly ask for help. That's just the, the way people are raised in our culture. Like I say, some, with some people it's directly, with others it's just they see how people that are successful have done things and they don't see people as part of that picture. And, and I blame that a lot on the successful people because there are so many top people on the internet and in uh, brick and mortar businesses who, if you look at their ad copy, there ain't a soul but them. It all it looks like they are the end all and be all of their company and everything they are doing. So I blame part of that also on some of our more successful entrepreneurs that aren't doing enough to show the people behind the curtains, so to speak, that have made them successful. You know, kind of like there used to be an expression back when everything was about um, about husbands and wives and couples, it used to the expression used to go behind every successful man, there is a strong woman. And, and I think that that phrase just needs to be expanded on a little in the more modern culture behind any successful person. There is a strong group of friends, family, co workers, supporters, uh, virtual assistants, and I'm sure I'm leaving out some folks. So <laughs> So I like to tell people if when you so I've, I've come to this expression, which I think helps a lot of people because it gets you to take the focus off of yourself and put it on the other person. So just think about this for a second. How good does it make you feel when you do something for a friend or a neighbor, you do something small and the best they can do for you is say thank you. Just just, you know, just think how that makes you feel. Makes you, you feel, feel great. Good? Yes. Yes. So when you refuse to ask you are robbing the other person of the joy they would have received from helping you. Yep. You know, and it's, I mean, so basically you're making somebody else's day harder because you are not allowing them to experience that joy. And trust me, there are lots of people who have spent their entire lives practicing, training, learning, rehearsing. Uh, they've been to courses, they've been to school, they've been through internships, they have information and experiences. And the best part of their day is when somebody comes along and sincerely says, hey, I am struggling with this. I know you are the expert on this. Would you please help me? And, you know, that is so important because um, we talk about this a lot um, on one of our podcasts. Uh, I have an attorney who's also um, a personal coach. And she will say over and over again in the podcast that, when it comes to technology, she can do it, but she it's very difficult for her and she doesn't like it. And so she'd rather ask for help. And she says, and she tells me, Karen, you know the technology. I'm not afraid to come and ask you for help. And I love it when she does that because on the legal side and on the coaching side, she has so much more to offer me. And so I can learn from her. She can learn from me. And at the end of the day, it's a win-win. And she's not the only one like that. And that's what I tell a lot of our listeners is that until you ask for help, how are you going to be able to go forward? Okay. Um, one of the things I found when I joined Podmatch, how wonderful everybody is out there that they're sharing their ideas and, um, information and they're coming on our shows and and being guests it's a wonderful group of people and it makes us all better for what we do yeah it is a wonderful group of people it's uh it's much larger now than i think um alex ever anticipated that it right. would grow to and it's kind of interesting because it's for those of y'all who aren't familiar podmatch.com it's uh set up as a match matchmaking site for hosts and guests 
and it's run off of artificial, artificial intelligence. So you fill out a form similar to an eHarmony dating form, if y'all know what that is. And uh, the algorithm will do its best to match you with other hosts. The other thing you can do is you can search for hosts and guests if you're wanting to do that. And it will actually tell you how good a fit you are, would probably be with that host exactly. before you take the time of sending them an email saying, you know, basically, I, you have, I know you haven't found me on Podmatch yet, but I really should be on your show and here's why. So, you know, when you look down and it says you're a 42% match, then you're like, yeah, I probably shouldn't send this email. But if, if you look down, you see you're at least a 75 or 80% match, then you're like, me and this host will probably have something in common. So it's, it's, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, it, it has grown to the point where now I feel like if you're going to get full use out of the system, you need to be using the search function and sending out some of your own emails and right. instead of depending strictly on it, to, on it to help hosts find you. But it's, I tell you, it's a very enjoyable site. And the one thing I have to say, and it's probably because me and Alex have been friends since 2019 when we, when we shared the Peachy Peachy stage at PodFest, is while it isn't as accessible yet as I would like it to be, I feel the sincere desire on his part to get it there. And I've seen it actual, actual progress made on some of the things that I've pointed out to him. And the interesting thing has been, I have had to learn how to talk to Alex because some things that I think are accessibility problems are not, they're workflow problems. And some things that I think are workflow problems, it turns out that, well, really they are accessibility to the coder. So it's been, kind of, I've, I've kind of had to learn in order to teach Alex how to make this website more accessible for his blind users. And before y'all say there aren't that many blind users, well, a while back, just for the fun of it, I did a search for podcasters who are disabled. And I came up with 37 different hosts that specifically listed disabled in their profiles as a host. Now, I'm willing to bet you there's, there's probably a lot more that are on the website. And there are probably even more who are able-bodied who love supporting people with disabilities like, you know, like you when you bring me on your podcast. So I've been impressed that he's taken steps. He, you know, he listens and that's, and, and that's all we really want. As a blind person, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, speak for the deaf or people in wheelchairs, but in general, people with disabilities, we want to feel wanted. We want to know that y'all actually want us on your website or at the door of your business and that you'll do what you can to make it more inviting and more accessible. And now I can speak for visually impaired people. There are just so many different types of accessibility for the visually impaired that is very difficult, especially for a small business owner or a, a single website developer to include them all because there are three different types of screen readers. There are two different main types of screen magnification software. You have Windows and, and Mac desktops or laptops. Then you also have Android versus <laughs> versus Apple iPhones or tablets. I mean, and that doesn't even get into the, the uh, being able to change the color contrast. I was on a website. I wish I could remember which one it was this week. They gave me the option of white on black or yellow on black. And I would have never thought of yellow on black. But apparently for some people, it's a higher contrast than white on black. And it makes the website easier to read with, with the magnification. So I appreciate the challenges that a business owner, especially a sole entrepreneur, has with accessibility. So yep. as long as y'all are trying, as long as you make me feel welcome, because here's the funny thing about, about a disabled uh, customer or employee. On, on average, a, a customer with a disability is going to be a more loyal customer, more likely to tell their friends and family about you, and more likely to overpay if that's required in order to continue using your product. I can't document that in any clinical studies, but I have enough anecdotal information that I can tell you that that's true. We're more loyal, more likely to refer, and we will overpay if we have to. Just look at just, uh, I can't tell you how many thousands of us Apple users there are who are overpaying for Apple products because of the effort they put in. The, and as far as employees, in general, not, not every single one, but in general, more loyal, more dedicated, more likely to help you solve your problems than to create their own problems or to make excuses, as I like to talk about, and uh, more likely to, help, to, to be with you during downtime. So, I mean, right. COVID isn't going to be the last time we go through this. And I can't tell you how many friends I have who 
who stuck with companies, uh, even though it meant taking less pay for, for a while because they just felt like they belonged there. Absolutely. Well, you know, I never thought that I was ever going to have a disability. I don't know why I thought that, but I didn't. I mean, we don't plan for it. Let's put it that no, way. We all think we're invincible. Right. And um, in the last, about 10 years ago, um, I developed a tumor in my left ear and uh, I lost my hearing. And uh, when the doctor went in to do the surgery, he accidentally went into the wrong ear first. Uh. So I lost the hearing in both ears. Um, and I came out and the first thing I was told was, uh, you're going to need to wear hearing aids. Uh, and I worked in a very youthful uh, corporate environment. So my first reaction was, I can't tell anybody. I got to hide them, you know, and, you know, I have to make these work perfectly. Well, to be honest, uh, that took a lot more energy than I ever should have put into it. Because when I finally started admitting to people, yes, I wear hearing aids. I can typically hear everything I'm supposed to, but occasionally there are certain sounds, certain tones that I just don't get. And once I opened up, I had a group of people who stood around me and said, if you ever need help, let me know. And I looked at them very strangely. It was like, really, you want to help me? Um, and so all of a sudden my personality changed as well. I started being more open as well, because we never know when something is going to change our life and we're going to have to ask for help because if we don't, it's going to make it that much more difficult. Right. And, you know, to, to, to the, to the point of the, the name of your show, the maze, um, those people, the, the, those of us who make it a habit of finding a way to deal with the, with the small inconveniences that happen every day, that find a way to, to, to find solutions or to at least approach it with a positive attitude, so much more, so much healthier, so much more able to deal with the big changes when they do come along. Right. You are so right. So, so just think about the, the spilled coffee, the broken jar of mayonnaise, the guy who won't drive 55 miles an hour in front of you on the way to work. The way you deal with all these things is preparing you for that one day when God forbid or when devil forbid that you have a serious major accident, catastrophe, disability, etc. Well, I know we can learn a lot from you, Maxwell, and I understand that you are also an author. Tell me about that. Right. Well, I like to say I never plan on writing a book, much less four of them. And I wrote my first book on a dare, actually. Uh, a woman challenged me to write a book in 60 days to be part of a virtual summit. And we had some back and forth about the wisdom of that. And I finally told her that if this ended badly, I was going to let everybody in the world know it was her fault. Um, <laughs> After I started writing the book, she came to me, she said, you know, Max, there are four other women already booked for this thing, and they've decided it'll be better if it's all women. So, uh, so you're out. And I'm like, you know, that's okay, because I'm the son of a carnival owner. I've got I'm probably more of a promoter than anything else in my life. So I understand the value of wanting to put more feet on the ground or butts in the seats or faces behind the screen. So I'm like, that's cool. But, you know, you reminded me that I enjoy writing, so I'm just going to keep writing. Uh, I had remembered my love of writing just a little bit with the blog, but even more so with the first book. And eventually I got to where I was at that point that I think a lot of authors, authors get to where um, I've, I've said everything that I need to say, but for some reason, this story doesn't feel long enough or big enough or important enough to be published. And so I was sharing it with some close friends and I was like, there's something wrong with this. It's some, there's something missing. I just think it isn't isn't quite there yet to be released. And a good friend from California finally said, you know, Max, I know you're concerned about the length of this book. She said, but I printed it out on my computer and it's the perfect size. She says, I can carry it around in my purse and refer to it whenever I want to. So she said, I know who you're, I know who the editor of your, the, she said, I know that you've worked with an editor on some blog post for your website. And she says, I know who she is. Uh, by the way, my editor is Lorraine Regulate at wordingwell.com. I feel
feel like I have to mention or whatever I get a chance because okay because the book probably would have never got released or if it had it would have been years later without her so I really appreciate her she's a good friend too she said so I know who to, she said so if you don't if you don't send this book off to be published I'm going to do it for you and so eventually six months later it was released on Amazon it's called leading you out of the darkness into the light a blind man's inspirational guide to success and it includes uh it's basically talking about my transition from being a carnival owner to an equipment broker and probably a little bit of the beginning of being a blogger and an online personality. So the book includes 11 exercises and it has my email so people can correspond with me as they're working through the exercises. And I also share my take on how I actually handled some of the questions that I'm asking them to ask themselves. So I feel like it's a really strong book now that I've had a little time to let it sit with me for what, eight years now. Um, and it's, and it's the funny thing is I've, I've written three other books since then. I thought each of those other three books was better than this one. And this one still sells more and has sold more than the other three combined. So, uh, and, and I've been told the, the main reason for that is that the first book is more approachable. And so uh, I've been encouraged to possibly consider the next time I write a book, maybe maybe breaking the book into more than one book, because uh, for, for some reason, you know, I guess, you know, you think about people's attention span, how, you know, the, they're only willing to wait microseconds now for a website to load. Right. So, yep. so maybe that's just one of the trends we have to live with that nobody wants to read a 250 or 300 word, 300 page book anymore that they want to they want to keep it to like 120 or 150 so uh, yeah. I, I won an award for, I, I won an award for that book called the Amtrak Writers in Residence and I used my prize from them to take a trip to New York City during the Christmas and New Year's holidays of 2016-2017 and and that ended up being the focus of my third book the Blind Bloggers New York City Adventures and I've so, since written a fourth book about my first efforts traveling the country to do book signings and speaking to promote my books. Uh, and in between, I wrote a book about my experiences preparing for and then having gastric surgery and then, uh, you know, how my life has continued to progress since then. So some things that I thought would help people uh, who are also struggling with with weight loss. And who knows now that people are coming out of COVID, maybe that book will get discovered. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. We talked about this in the beginning, how people will say, well, I have nothing to talk about. Who's going to listen to me? And just some of the things that you've written about, you know, most of us have struggled with our weight, whether we weigh too much or we don't weigh enough. Um, I wish I had that problem, not weighing enough, but that's besides the point. Um, but we've all had these we struggles. All do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes hearing it from another person, oh, this is what you went through. This is what you had to do. You know, it, it gives you an opportunity to say, let me check it out rather than just reading, you know, something that you're not familiar with. Um, one example is uh, I've been on medication for the last year that has blown me up and put weight on me. And I've been told once we get you off this medication, it'll go away. I wish I could get off the medication. But in the meantime, I decided I'm going to join Weight Watchers because Weight Watchers is supposed to help me lose weight. Well, it's not going to because of my medication. Okay. So for the last two months, I've been spending all this money with Weight Watchers being really good eating well. Um, and I then read uh, a blog by somebody who went through something very similar. And then I contacted my doctor and he said, well, yeah, I've been telling you this all along, you know, like just calm down. We'll take care of your medication first and then you can lose weight. Um, but we all have something to write about. We all have a story to tell. Yeah. The difference is, is that um, not everybody has people who will challenge you or encourage you to tell it. Right. I mean, and that really goes back to having a community of people either in person or on the internet who you know will encourage you because I, uh, I, I fought the idea that I was inspirational for two years before I finally accepted it and started the second website. And finally, the, the lady who finally made me understand it, her name is Adrienne Smith. And 
I like to refer to her as my blogging mama because she taught me everything I know about uh, about being a blogger, especially relationship building and relationship marketing and using blog commenting and and sharing of, of other people's content to uh, to build relationships that lead to other opportunities. And and she's like, you know, Max, here's the thing you're not understanding. She says you have a built in excuse. If you wanted to stay home and sit on your couch and eat junk food and, and watch or listen to your TV, nobody would say the first word about it. They would be, you know, that's that's just him. And they really wouldn't have expected much else out of you. She said the fact that you have a built in excuse and don't use it and show up every day is what makes you compelling. She says, because there are so many people who don't have an obvious disability or roadblock who are really not doing anything other than what they did yesterday. They sleepwalk through their days and they don't take risks. They don't get out of, outside of their comfort zone. They don't challenge themselves and they don't have an excuse while you do. So uh, I do my best to continue showing up. I have bad days just like everybody else does. The one thing I like to make sure people understand is, is that I am not anybody special. And I recently had a great conversation with somebody about this. He said, Max, why do you say you're not anything special? I said, the most important reason. If Max was anything special, then there'd be no reason for y'all to listen to Max because y'all wouldn't be able to do what Max does. You know, I love that. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. I mean, there'd be no point. Why would I, why would I share this with y'all if y'all couldn't do anything? And that's, and I, that's my recent, one of my biggest recent aha moments was, wait a minute, you know, I, and I don't want to discourage people. I don't want people to look at Max's life and go, well, Max has got it all together. He's doing everything so amazingly well. I could never be that person. So again, you know, I want people to know I have nothing special. I'm just a guy who, one, I show up, two, I ask for help, three, I'm not smart enough to be scared, and four, I don't really know how to quit. What terrific advice, and I love it. So how can our listeners find you out on the web, Max? Right. They can go to theblindblogger.net. They are, they are also welcome to send me an email to just ask at theblindblogger.net. Uh, they can find my podcast on the website, or they can also find it along with other shows hosted by people with disabilities at wyexcuse.com. And if you don't mind me, uh, one more thing, they can also sure. just they can also just tell Alexa or Google, hey, play what's your excuse. So that's where they can find Max. Um, if there's something on my website or anything that you're wondering about, curious about, uh, just know that I my belief is that it's easier for me to answer an awkward question than it is for me to, for, to let you guess. So don't worry about it. If there's something like I don't want to offend him by asking this question. Well, I've been on 400 plus podcasts. If somebody hasn't asked it and offended me with it already, then you're definitely okay. So, <laughs> I mean, just, you know, in your, in your life, how many times have you had to clean up a mess because somebody tried to figure out instead of just asking you? Right. Exactly. You are so right. Well, I'm so excited that we finally got together. You've been on today. We'll have to have you on in the future. Maybe just talk about one of your books. I think that would be a fun podcast. Well, that would be a great honor. And anytime uh, you want or need me, I'd be more than happy to come back again. And I uh, look forward to uh, to meeting with some of the great people that follow your podcast. I, I One of the main reasons I do these is hoping to meet some great new people. And one thing I want to make sure I, I don't forget is this. Um, I started doing podcast interviews in 2013 because I felt stuck. I didn't have a way to meet people face to face. So without uh, hosts like yourself who spend the time to get to know me, to, to ask great questions, people wouldn't know who the heck the blind blogger is. They wouldn't know about what's your excuse. So, so many things that have happened have happened because of podcasters. And I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you being part of my journey and part of my continuing story. Well, I'm glad you're part of my journey. And again, to our listeners, I wouldn't get to know people like Maxwell if I wasn't doing what I'm doing today. Uh, Maxwell, you're in Texas, correct? Yep. And, I, in, and, yep. and just, just to piggyback off you what you just said, so people, be selfish. Start your own podcast. Absolutely. Um, so there's Maxwell in Texas. I'm in Ohio. And last week, I did a podcast with somebody in Sweden. So, you know, it's wonderful because it is a very small world. 
but this is a great way to get to know each other and also realize how much we are all alike, more alike than different. Maxwell, thank you for joining us today. And uh, all the information on how to find Maxwell will be in the show notes. So no excuse, uh, you'll be able to find it there. And uh, I want you to follow him as well because um, inspirational is just one word to identify Maxwell Ivy. So thank you so much. You're very welcome and thank you. Have a great day now.